Um, uh, I'm currently working on a new release for the Omega theme. It's uh, the fourth version of uh, Omega. Um, uh, and uh, we have uh, lately introduced quite some drastic changes in how we uh, um, uh, work with the base theme. Um, uh, we have retreated from uh, trying to provide a full stack solution for building layouts uh, through the user interface. Um, it was a nice solution uh, when, uh, by the time uh, at SAS and uh, responsiveness and all that fancy stuff uh, came to Drupal and uh, was uh, introduced to the uh, larger majority of the people. Um, but it turned out to be a little bit too um, complicated to maintain as a full stack solution that would actually work in very complex use cases as well as uh, simple use cases. And uh, also we had some issues with performance and um, so I started to um, write uh, a new version which um, would try to focus again on um, things that uh, would, uh, we considered as best practices um, and uh, things that I think will greatly improve, improve performance and uh, uh, adoption of this base theme. Um, one thing that we're very glad about is that, uh, especially during the last couple of months, um, we had some great interaction with other base theme maintainers, uh, for example, Sam Richard Smuggock, who's working on the fabulous uh, Aurora theme, as well as uh, John Arvin from Sam. And, um, as you will notice, if you ever have a chance to look at the code, um, many pieces of uh, the code base in uh, Aurora, Omega, and uh, Zen are actually shared. So we have been starting to collaborate a lot um, for the better of all of us. And uh, I think I would like to begin with showing you how we um, um, started to, uh, or how we um, draw the line between Omega-3 and Omega-4, what the differences are. Um, so in Omega-3, let me just show you the base theme settings. Omega-3 had a really extensive user interface for setting up um, your layout through the user interface. Um, it had a concept of zones, sections, zones, and regions. Um, the problem with that is it is um, not really uh, flexible in, in regards of, of um, um, creating <coughs> really fluid layouts. So you can't really uh, move around things as freely as you would be able to do if you had um, a, a simple CSS and uh, custom HTML solution. So this generates, this, this configuration generates your markup and it also generates the CSS uh, for placing all the configuration that you provided through the user interface appropriately. Um, I think it is a really good example of uh, how, how um, or I think it's, 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 it speaks for itself that no other content management system or any other um, uh, solution in the web provides a user interface which solves this problem accurately. There is simply no solution for doing so <coughs> Um, because it always has constraints. Um, and because of that, we also decided to go back to uh, a more simplistic approach uh, and uh, pro instead provide a framework, which um, a basin really should be, um, with improvements to the existing Drupal core code, um, bug fixes, bug fixes that will never uh, actually make it into the Drupal 7 core release. Um, because they would interfere with existing websites, break existing websites, um, if they were uh, going to be committed. Um, things like, uh, for example, say, um, the Java JavaScript in Drupal, um, uh, there's currently no, no way for attaching a JavaScript file um, by providing a uh, IE conditional statement, for example. These are things. These are things that, um, if they were committed to, to Drupal 7, uh, could potentially break existing sites because it's a, an API change. And uh, what we did is we provided um, code in the Omega 4 theme 
which uh, fixes these issues. We also try to chase Drupal 8 head as, as good as possible. For example, we are converting existing uh, HTML5 layouts, HTML5 templates, and uh, refurbished and cleaned up CSS files to the base team and override the existing Drupal core styles with these files. Um, so I think this is uh, it for the introduction about uh, the Omega 4 theme and how it uh, tries to get back to the foundation of what a base theme should do. And uh, let me now work, um, take a look at the uh, Drush integration first. And uh, so we're going to set up our own sub theme based of, of the Omega 4 base theme, and uh, then configure it uh, to our for our needs to get started with creating a new uh, new appearance on new, new theme. Um, okay, so. Um, opposed to Omega 3, we are no longer in need for a module like Omega Tools to provide Drush integration. Um, the new Drush version allows themes to provide Drush integration. So um, we now have uh, the Drush commands directly integrated into the theme. Um, the Drush commands uh, include a way for new to create new sub themes on the command line. Um, creating sub themes. Sorry? Creating sub-themes is um, as easy as uh, invoking the command osub, which is the shortcut for Omega sub-theme, and giving it um, a uh, nice name. This will generate the sub-theme sub in uh, sites all themes. Uh, it's also possible to be more specific and, for example, attach the theme to a profile that you have, for example, Drupal Commerce. If Drupal Commerce was, about, uh, was going to um, uh, provide a, a new base theme, like the Omega Kickstarter base theme, they would simply specify an alternative um, destination. And uh, additionally, you can also manually specify the machine name, otherwise, it would get auto generated. Um, other commands include exporting the theme settings, which is really handy if you want to deploy your theme to a, to a server. Um, it allows you to create new layouts. I will get back to that topic later on. And it allows you to revert the existing theme settings that you have in the database to the version that you have in the file, um, which is also a nice way of testing your exported code. OK, so far for the Rush integration, we just created a new theme. Um, so let's go to the Appearance tab and enable that theme. This is the theme that we just created. Okay, so we now enable that theme. Um, this is the uh, default representation of the new theme. Um, going to the settings. This is now a really um, um, good showcase for how the theme settings uh, user interface differs from the one that we had in Omega 3. Instead of a blown user interface where you could create and uh, manipulate the, uh, rep the visual representation of the layout, you now get extensions. Um, extensions is a plugin system for the theme layer, which it was introduced by Omega 4. It allows you or your base theme or your company base theme or your sub theme to define custom extensions or manipulate existing extensions to provide groups of settings, which can be enabled and disabled all at the same time uh, by simply enabling or disabling the extension over here through this checkbox. Um, this is all uh, provided through a uh, um, info hook system which is custom through the Omega 4 theme. Um, and uh, you can create new layouts, and new extensions quite simply by simply um, following the existing pattern in the Omega base theme. Um, so, for example, here we have the development extension. It is as easy as uh, writing a single info file for, for the extension to be, to be picked up. An extension provides settings and the user interface for manipulating those settings. And it provides integration um, with uh, the theme and with the uh, procedural code in Drupal through the theme registry and through procedural code that it injects through the theme registry. Okay, so whenever we disable an extension, we are not loading this extension into the registry. It will never be invoked, thus save the performance impact that it would otherwise have. <clears throat> okay, so let's say we enable the um, scripts extension, 
um, we are given the settings that the script, ex uh, script extension exposes. So for example, we have the option to output all the JavaScript in our uh, Drupal installation into the footer. Um, this is something really interesting for front-end performance because usually in, uh, in, an, in a web application, um, the files that are in the header are loaded before the document actually gets rendered. So it's really a good idea to reduce the amount of, of files or the file size in general uh, to a minimum in the header. And everything that can be placed in the footer without having a negative effect on the rendering of the site, um, because some files have to stay in the header regardless of this uh, problem with performance, um, gets moved into the footer and thereby improves the front-end performance. So this is just a uh, utility functionality that allows you to enhance your theme. Additionally, the scripts extension comes with uh, common libraries that help you to provide backwards compatibility with outdated browsers like uh, Internet Explorer, for example. Um, these come with a base theme, you can easily enable them. Uh, some also provide settings. And you can also, in your client, uh, in your uh, company base theme or any other uh, base theme that you are going to create on top of Omega, provide your own custom libraries that will be shown he in here as well, maybe even in your custom group. <clears throat> okay, so let's just show how this works by simply enabling these. Oh, this is an um, Okay, so we have now enabled the uh, two libraries that I just showed you. And the two libraries should now be uh, edit, as you can see here. Uh, it's as easy as that um, to provide HTML5 backwards compatibility for your theme. Um, the JavaScript that is movable to the bottom is now in the bottom, in the footer. And, uh, okay so far for the first extension. So this is an example of how an extension works. Uh, it provides a group of functionality, um, which you can toggle on and off easily by simply disabling the extension as, uh, as a whole, or um, disabling the particular functionality that you want to disable. Um, style sheets, the style sheets extension does something very similar. Um, it allows you to improve the performance of your frontend by uh, um, allowing you to aggregate Java the CSS files in an improved fashion. Um, this is an idea that I have been playing around with since uh, Omega 3. Um, many people still tend to define the media queries for their responsive CSS files in the uh, style sheets array in the info file. Um, that's a bad habit, um, but still it's something that people usually do. And uh, with this setting, it allows you to aggregate the media queries and write them in line to the file. So when, you, uh, when the CSS aggregates are being created, uh, it reduces the amount of aggregated file chunks and thereby it also increases the front-end performance by reducing the amount of uh, files that you need to download. Um, this extension, the compatibility one extension, um, comes with a couple of settings that allow you to um, provide uh, meta tags for, for Internet Explorer specific, specifically, as well as other browsers. Um, what it shows, what it does is easily shown by simply going back to the site and looking at the source code. So for example, it provides you with uh, IE conditional classes in the header. Uh, it provides you with lots of meta tags. You can manipulate which ones you want to show by simply changing the settings. Okay, um, so this is an interesting concept, the layouts, that uh, I tried to um, uh, bring to Omega 4. It uh, allows you, as the same way as you define extensions, to create custom layouts. It is basically the same what the context module does through the page layouts module that it has as a sub-module. It allows you to provide alternative page templates, which you can uh, manage, manipulate um, manually or through uh, integration with context module or panels, invoke on specific site conditions. For example, if you want on one subsection of your site to uh, render a different layout, you would simply uh, create a custom layout um, by providing the information for that layout in code. So a layout that ships with Omega is the Epico layout. Um, it's also an info file, 
which defines the regions that are being used by that layout. It defines the style sheets that the layout uses, and it defines JavaScript that the layout uses. Um, there's a hook for changing the layout, which is called Omega um, Layout Alter. Uh, you can use that to manually change the layout in code based on certain page conditions. For example, on Drupal front pages, you want to swap out the layout. It's as easy as implementing that hook. Or alternatively, you could provide um, uh, plugin integrations with the uh, common modules, context, panels, etc., to, to, to do this. Um, the layout APICO is enabled by default. You don't have to use this functionality. You can also disable this, this uh, extension and fall back to the standard Drupal page TPL management. But um, the idea of layouts is so that Omega is capable of providing a variety of uh, different layouts um, in, the, in the initial package uh, with different um, behaviors. So for example, this layout uh, was designed to have a responsive sidebar, uh, a uh, foldable sidebar, um, which I'm going to show you now, um, which would work like that. It's pretty ugly right now because it doesn't have any styling, because, but that's the whole point of it. Because the styling um, is part of your sub theme um, So this is one example for a layout. Um, you would, might want to have that on your blog, but you might not want to have that on the front page. So in case of uh, your front page, you would simply uh, create an alternative layout and uh, enable that on the front page instead. Um, one other interesting thing that you can do with Omega easily is um, exclude CSS or JavaScript files, which is a common practice in Drupal because the Drupal core CSS uh, is in, in, in some places, um, some modules that come with core really horrible. So some theme uh, developers, some front-end developers tend to exclude all CSS that comes with Drupal core um, right away. And, uh, this is possible through uh, complex logic, normally. Um, with Omega 4, I've wrote some uh, regular expression code, which allows you to exclude CSS files uh, on the fly with regular expressions and wildcards. So if I wanted to um, disable all module code uh, from system module, for example, I would simply uh, write this single line of code, or code regex wildcards line, um, which is namespace aware, so it knows what the system module is. And uh, as you can see, by, well, this is now visible. Uh, the system style sheets have been removed. I can just show here, so there are no system style sheets, right? Um, I could also go ahead and simply remove all style sheets, which is as easy as that. And that would look that, like that, then, right? Um, so it allows you to do uh, lots of interesting things uh, without having to uh, actually touch your own code. Um, another goal that I had with Omega was to um, improve performance. Um, Omega 3, as I mentioned before, had some performance issues on the high-profile websites. Um, the uh, main idea was to, first of all, fix performance issues that Drupal Core has with uh, managing themes. Um, for example, Drupal, uh, Drupal core function for theme settings, theme get setting, um, does have some logic in it that it constantly runs regardless of whether or not it's cached or not. Um, I proved that with a little hack, um, but it works and it's uh, really nice to, to see the theme get setting function to perform in a much better way. Um, we also wrote code to um, improve the leanliness of your uh, theme code. Um, complex themes tend to have a lot of pre-process and process functions. They also tend to have a lot of theme hook overrides. Um, and what we came up with was a, uh, a piece of code that allows us to um, split up our pre-process and process functions across multiple different files so that every single function simply resides in its own namespace file. Okay, so if you wanted to pre-process your blog template, you would simply put that into your theme folder and the pre-process folder. 
Alternatively, if you want to process your block, you would do the same in the process folder. And this, these files are being picked up by the scene registry function in Drupal, uh, in, in Omega, which uh, finds and scans for these files based on a naming pattern and injects them into the scene registry. So uh, there's no performance impact for this functionality. Actually, it uh, is some sort of lazy loading for, for uh, um, pre-process and theme hooks. And yeah, the same, the same works for theming functions. Okay. Um, right. Are there any questions? Well, well, this is actually scheduled as above. So uh, I would like to discuss uh, theming techniques. I would like to discuss uh, base theme evaluations. I would I like have to. Yeah. About, about uh, viewport. You showed. <coughs> Yeah. Uh, how you can configure uh, what you want to include in your viewport? Okay, so um, this is something that I've been asked quite a few times already. Um, you're talking about this setting for the meta tag, right? Yes. Um, I have been um, in, in con uh, discussion about this uh, several times, and uh, it turns out that the normal use case for this meta tag is to simply configure the viewport to something like that. Oh, wrong side. To this. Um, some people advocate for you to use in initial scale one. Um, I have read on several blog posts that that is not a good solution because there are cross-browser uh, issues with that. Um, but in Omega 3, I know we had an option for you to configure that. And because so, people, so many people have demanded that we put that back in, I will probably do that. So there will be a field set where you can configure how the viewport meta tag is going to look. Uh, what about the uh, media queries? Same configuration. Um, Can you configure that? No. And I totally advocate for you to do that in your own CSS. Um, I am a big fan of SAS. And uh, I'm a big fan of Suzy. And I'm a big fan of uh, Sam Richard, who is a great uh, SAS engineer um, and has quite a few uh, nice um, extensions for, for Compass on, on, on GitHub which allow you to easily manage your breakpoints. For example, there's an uh, extension called Respond2, which allows you to define an array of, of media queries in your SAS configuration files, and then refer to these in your SAS CSS files. So is it needed to define it to create my own uh, layout? If I want to create... Uh, I can show you the CSS file that we are using in the layout that I just showed you, the Epica one. Um, So we are, we are not really defining, so this is a custom function because I wasn't, I wasn't was unaware of the breakpoint uh, response to um, extension from Snugger, I wrote my own. Um, I, I've, I, as I said before, uh, I'm not a big fan of configuring things like that through the user interface. Um, I am actually one of the people who was against uh, Drupal 8, including a breakpoint module as well. Because now we have a breakpoint module in Drupal Core which allows you to configure breakpoints, which I don't really see the sense of. Um, because that's, that's something that should happen on behalf of the theme, and the theme should only be aware of what breakpoints it uses and how it wants to use them. It's a CSS thing, not, it's not a uh, module configuration thing. It's something that you have to manage in your CSS. So I highly um, suggest people start using SAS people start using SAS properly and people uh, use media queries in CSS instead of trying to build some sort of abstraction in PHP code on top of that to automate the process of configuring them. Yes? So you actually uh, removed all your uh, responsive features? Um, well, there is no such thing as responsive features. That is uh, something that we realized too late. Um, 
it is too complicated to replicate something. So I would I would be amazed if we had some 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 sort of user interface which would allow you to configure a layout in such a way that it is semantic, clean, and performant. Um, but there is no such solution on the web, and uh, we've tried to implement it, but it is just way too complicated to do that in code and uh, to make it make the output lean and clean and, and uh, performant. So what we suggest, or what I suggest, right, is to simply go back to the original approach of writing template files and writing CSS and um, making your templates clean and performant because that's what you actually want to do. You want to, to, to also do that because otherwise your, your themes at some point get unmaintainable, right? So. No, I mean because in Omega 3 there was a, I think that if you had a wide and normal and uh, yeah. narrow yes. layout, something. So you remove that, that. Yes, the problem with that is that um, configuring such a functionality comes with the uh, bad asset of having to have unsemantic CSS classes on all the wrappers that represent a grid element. So for example, you would have to have grid 1, grid 2, grid 3, etc. Omega and alpha classes everywhere on your HTML tags. Um, there are many, many different solutions for creating semantic grids um, through so SAS easily and working with them in SAS really easily. For example, there is uh, the fabulous ZenGrid system that the Zen-based theme maintainer came up with, John Arben. Um, there is a, the Suzy Grid system. Um, this is the URL. You really want to check that out. Uh, that's, that's the one I use. Uh, I didn't give the ZenGrid a proper text spin yet. I didn't uh, use it on a client project yet. Um, but I have heard lots of good things about it. And uh, on the third front, there we have the Singularity GS. It's a grid system created by um, uh, Sam Richard, the Aurora maintainer. And uh, these are all extensions for SAS, which you can use in order to create really good semantic uh, grid systems in your CSS. And it allows you, by, doing, by using this extension, it allows you to uh, control your, your, your responsive website in a much more flexible way than you would otherwise be able to if you use a pre-configured CSS grid file. Uh, because if you do that, you would have to start juggling around with classes and probably even write jQuery uh, or JavaScript code in order to swap out the grid classes on certain screen sizes or uh, override the, the uh, grid, grid styling, which you don't want. Right? I mentioned that because uh, when we were, uh, we were building the, the team for our event, it was really easy to make this first prototype with Omega. Yeah. Have it uh, it's easy. Do you, I mean, are you afraid that maybe you will lose some, you know, uh, actually downloads because of that? Yes, um, so that is one of the reasons why we are still in Alpha 1. The code is pretty stable, the existing code works, and we also have already have quite a few uh, live sites built on the Omega 4 racing. Um, uh, the reason why we are not moving for a stable release yet is because A, we don't have the documentation finished yet, um, and B, because uh, there is no, re uh, no replacement for the UI. So um, what we are going to do is we will provide a module which allows you to um, well, easily create layouts through the user interface, which are then converted and export it into HTML and CSS, which is semantic at the same time. Uh, and you can then place these exported HTML and CSS in your uh, theme folder. That's the idea. Um, we don't want to keep it in the database anymore. We don't want to uh, render stuff on runtime. We don't want to render the actual layout when the page is being displayed. So the idea is to have a module instead of building that into the theme. Because in the theme, you would have to do that with the scene settings. Uh, the scene doesn't have to, doesn't have a way to expose many elements. So um, doing that in the theme settings comes with the um, uh, drawback that you don't really have a possibility to pro to provide a nice user experience. Uh, 
because you are bound to what the Steam settings page looks like in your admin theme. You can't really modify that easily. It's, yeah. So it's a module. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, because, I mean, on the other hand, I'm really against those, you know, breakpoints. Because there is one concept of that breakpoints are really stupid because you should, you should break your, your, I mean, breakpoint should be based on the content. Yeah. Well, right? So not when your screen is 170 pixels wide, but when the content makes sense that it would break. Yeah, I applaud to you for that statement. That is perfectly correct. Um, in the past, people have been uh, writing breakpoints um, to fit certain screen sizes so that they would replicate certain device width, right? So you would have a breakpoint for uh, an iPhone screen, you would have a breakpoint for a tablet screen, you would have a breakpoint for whatever, right? Um, that is not a good idea because A, you don't know what, sh what type of devices will be available on the market in the next year, right? So the screen sizes might change. Uh, so your, your designs might look crooked on new devices. Um, also, you can't really provide a million breakpoints if there are a million devices. And uh, by, by going back to, to providing media queries for your content, so um, I, I went to Manchester a few weeks ago and I met a guy there who said breakpoints um, are where the content breaks. Okay? So once you resize your screen and the website, excuse me, starts to look crap, um, that is when you should place a breakpoint because the site breaks, okay? So that's how it should work. That's how you should do it. And you can define, redefine the same media query in your CSS a hundred times. It doesn't matter. CSS is fast. It's blatantly fast, actually. Evaluating CSS is not an issue. So if you recreate the same media query in multiple different places, uh, just because that makes your CSS file look more sane and more maintainable. You can do so, that's no problem, it's not an issue. Uh, you had this aggregation of media queries there? Yeah. So that means that if I, for example, put media queries uh, that have the same query? No, no. Uh, what it does is, if you go into your theme info file and provide a style sheet, instead of all, you would have media, whatever, uh, screen and something something in here, right? It would identify that media query and see, okay, that is not media at all. And if you have something like this in your uh, output, it actually looks like this. So let me just clear the cache and we can look at it. Um, oh, I removed all the CSS, so I have to bring that back. So, as you can see, um, or you don't. Well, it didn't work, but well, you can look at the point anyways. So, what, it, what happens if you create a media query, or write a media query into the info file like that? Once you start to aggregate your CSS files by checking that checkbox on the performance tab in your admin configuration page, um, it will break once it iterates over the style sheets to pull them together into a single aggregated CSS file. And break at that point where it reaches this, this CSS file we just added with a custom media query. Create a new aggregate, and once it's finished with that, and reaches another file which doesn't use the same media query, start over again with another aggregate. So you end up with three aggregates instead of one. And um, downloading more files also means it takes longer for the browser to actually finish rendering your website. So what you really want to have is to optimize the output in your uh, the output of assets that you have in your uh, in your front end. So you want to reduce the amount of the file the file size and the amount of files for CSS and for JavaScript. And by enabling that configuration, you um, um, don't end up to have these different uh, aggregates because it notices that there is a different media query and writes that media query into the file instead. That is what, that is what it does. 
That was done probably because of the print uh, and screen. Sorry? They wanted to separate print and screen and CSS file in Drupal, I mean. Yeah. But yeah, so they they were creating media cards like that, and by that you it, it, uh, increase the amount of the, the number of files that you have, which is not a good idea. So you should avoid it anyways. I mean, you should not do this anyways uh, because of how Drupal aggregation works. Um, but if you do it, you can rest assured that Omega will handle the work of aggregating them anyways. Okay. Any other questions? I mean, we are here for discussing anyways. Uh, sorry, I didn't. Uh, sorry, uh, so the Omega 4, uh, uh, there's going to be more differences between Omega 3 and Omega 4 yes. than there will be yes. Omega 4 and Zen Grids. Well, uh, Omega 4 and Zen. Zen Grids is just a SAS extension which uh, the same guy wrote that also yeah. created the Zen theme. Um, you mentioned that uh, you collaborate. Well, I mostly collaborate with Snodax and Richard. Um, I also um, come, have a lot of conversations with, uh, with uh, John Arvin. Um, he uh, is a great guy. He works on the Zen theme and he has a lot of cool stuff in the Zen theme. Uh, we keep exchanging experiences and we keep exchanging code and CSS and template files. Um, so just lately, I, I, two days ago, I, for example, copied over three files uh, at the same time. Um, the Aurora maintainer uh, copied half of the template PHP file just because um, there are slight differences, <coughs> right? Uh, and you still have to choose which theme suites uh, suit you the best, um, but the differences are decreasing, so to say. So, yeah. So this module that will be used with Omega 4 to, be, to use interface to build layouts uh, will be. To I'm not even sure if I'm going to make it uh, a suggested download module. Mm -hmm. We might make it so that instead we are going to uh, publish a website um, which um, has the possibility for you to uh, build, a layout, build a layout there and then export it from the website. So you don't really have to download it because it is just something that allows you to export HTML and CSS. Um, and I'm, this is just something that I'm dreaming of. It's not uh, nearly finished, yeah? um, because it's not my main, my main priority. Uh, I am advocating for people to go back to writing HTML and CSS because that is simply um, the one solution which will give you the best possible output. Um, doing it manually because CSS and HTML is an art. You have to craft those files. To make them look like. Yeah. Why you use SAS? Sorry? Why then you use SAS if you use CSS? Oh, uh, SAS. Um, who's using SAS here? You're not using SAS? No. Um, so, everybody who didn't raise their arms right now, you should use SAS. Okay? Right. I know actually, well, I know CSS. I don't use SAS or um, other technology. Right. So it is, it is SAS, so everything that you write in CSS is... JavaScript, CSS, I know. PHP, C Sharp, I know. Java, I know. I know. Because when you, when you start working on a client project, you are most likely going to share the work with other developers in your team. Also, you're most likely going to iteratively increase the amount of CSS that you have in your files. Also, you're probably going to come back at a later point in time and start cleaning up things or something like that. SAS is the clean and easy and fast and more enjoyable way of writing CSS because it allows you to uh, nest styles. You don't have to redefine the same classes all over again. You can create CSS components that you can reuse in multiple places, you don't have to repeat yourself. Um, and you can use grid frameworks which do all the math that is required to calculate width of elements. 
Uh, there are so many aspects of SAS that make SAS so much more enjoyable than plain CSS, and you should really use SAS if you're not using it yet. And SAS is easier to reuse than CSS. Yeah, okay, that's good. Show, show them SAS. So uh, SAS is even easier to use than CSS, because with CSS, you will at some point get lost in your 4,000 lines of CSS that you have in your files. And with SAS, you can create tree structures which allow you to create a modular, uh, a modular uh, tree system of, of uh, CSS that you can include and, and put together and assemble it into the final output of your file. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, Do you have already included all features? Um, there's one thing that I saw uh, when I was uh, talking with uh, Sam Richard lately um, is a uh, little setting which allows you to show a big alert message when someone comes to your site who uses Internet Explorer. Like, use Chrome <laughs> or something like that. Um, <laughs> Well, no, I'm, so the base of the features that I have in there are the features that I want to ship with. There's nothing big, at least, that I can think of right now which I want to add. Um, I want to increase the amount of implementations for these features. So currently I just have one single layout. I want to ship with a variety of layouts. Um, and for example, the commerce guys might want to use this to ship with a variety of different layouts that they can use for their shops. Um, so yeah, I, I want to uh, increase the amount of layouts that I have. Um, I want to, I, I, for example, I don't have modernizer included yet. Um, I want to probably revise the development settings, the development configuration. Yeah. So, but uh, I can use it uh, for live websites. Um, I, as I said, um, so Jake Strong, who is the original project owner of the Omega theme, is going to kill me if I say that now, but, but I'm already using it a lot, and I consider it stable, um, it is working, I haven't seen any PHP bugs uh, or anywhere, right? Um, it makes uh, theming much more enjoyable without having to it, and uh, I've uh, shipped themes, like eight different themes for clients with Omega 4 already. So, well, there are, uh, do you know Amazing Edge? Like people from Switzerland? Um, they have three websites already on Omega 4, as far as I remember. Two websites? Two? I don't, I don't, I don't know. No, Two I, or three. I was asking, uh, I didn't understand what you said. They already have three websites based on uh, Omega 4. Um, yeah, this website, for example, this is already Omega 4. Um, right, and it's a whole full responsive period as well. Right, so this is Omega 4. Right. And, yeah. Can you explain? Yeah. Check it out. So, guy in the back, please, first. Okay, can okay. you explain the concept of the widgets? I saw you have a folder there below layouts. Oh, this year. Um, yeah. uh, that's, it totally depends on what I'm working on. Um, usually I try to, to stick as close as possible to the concept called uh, object-oriented CSS and uh, uh, follow the um, uh, methodology that uh, the SMAX CSS system uh, advocates for. Um, I don't know if you know SMAX. Do you know SMAX? I mean, not the Kellogg's Smax. Uh, Smax is a concept of writing modular CSS, right? Um, so there's a free, free version uh, which for a PDF file which explains the concept of Smax. Smax basically, SMAC basically allows you, or is a methodology for you to write complex CSS structures so that you can come back at any point uh, time later on and, and still 
know what you were doing when you were writing that CSS back then, um, because it helps you to, to keep your CSS maintainable. It helps you organize your CSS in a way that makes it more fun to work with. Okay? Um, and I tried to use a, a similar approach for that, um, which works best for me uh, with SAS, and uh, try to make it as object-oriented as possible. So for example, if I um, create a styling for a button, right? I don't write the CSS um, as part of the class selector for the button, button or as part of whatever selector. Instead, I use a concept uh, of uh, SAS, which is called um, extending, right? So what I do is I create a placeholder selector in which I put all the styles, that one has a generic name, and then later on I can reuse that component, that widget, uh, in other places. And that's what I use widgets for. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Uh, when we talked about SAS, what about LESS? Um, LESS is nice. LESS uh, <laughs> is nice. <laughs> yeah, LESS is nice, but it's less nice. Right. Uh, which is better, SAS or LESS? Um, well, I don't know which one came first, uh, but that's not, not the point. So SAS allows you to do way more. It is the current uh, uh, standard, the technology that uh, most people use. Um, that most of the people that I consider the um, total gurus on this uh, topic uh, are using. Um, um, and it's simply much more extendable than less is. So you can easily iterate, you can, you can, you can use procedural logic in your style sheets, style sheets with SAS in a much more advanced way than you can with, with less. Um, there are many, many articles on the web of, uh, they are, they are com that are comparing SAS and LESS. 99% um, consider SAS much more powerful than LESS. And I would suggest going for SAS directly. Uh, the maintainers of SAS also seem to be much more active in that community. Um, I really suggest using SAS instead. Uh, I'm not saying LESS is bad. LESS, is bad. less uh, was one of the um, Competitors, basically, yeah. it did great work as well, so it's not nothing bad. So yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah. The microphone. Oh, there. Uh, <coughs> uh, my second question is uh, how to contribute to a microphone. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, uh, I tried once, but. There was no issues in the issue queue, and there was no documentation, mm -hmm. no experience, nothing. There is no a list about the uh, uh, future things uh, I should work on. Do you have some list or something? So the best way to contribute to uh, Omega um, is to just ping me on IRC and talk with me of how we can improve things. Um, going to the issue queue works as well. Um, Currently, I'm the only person working on it. Um, there's a few lines of code that I copied from Aurora, a few lines of code that I copied from Zen. Um, there's a few lines of code that uh, I figured out uh, and that worked on together with a few people that I know from Vienna. Um, but in general, it's really just me currently. And I would love to have assistance with it, um, especially uh, by uh, with uh, providing more layouts, like providing more different uh, instances for the implementation. Um, so, for example, that would be a really good, uh, good way of, of helping me with bringing my Mega 4 to a stable release, um, is writing layouts. So, uh, install SAS, uh, write HTML, and uh, put that into a layout, and uh, create a patch, post it on the issue queue, ping me on IRC, give me the link, uh, I will commit that if it's, if it's good. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so one question. Uh, I think we've compared nicely how Omega 4 compares to Zen and how it compares to Aurora. So I'm asking about adaptive theme because I was asked why we passed on adaptive theme Kickstarter and I had no good answer. Uh. 
So, um, Emma Jane is uh, not only a really cool person, but also a great Drupal developer and front-end person. And she had a few good presentations on the same topic called Evaluating Base Themes. And uh, I would suggest you um, look at that presentation later on. I think there are also YouTube videos from Munich which um, show the presentation. And, and she um, outlines what the different themes are and what concepts they follow. Um, um, so there are different, she, she has different, she categorizes the base themes in different concepts. Uh, adapt, adopt, enact, right? And um, these are adapt to the core, whatever is it? Well, she categorized all the themes. I'm not going to look up the uh, categorization now. But um, adaptive theme is much more similar to Omega 3 than it. So I would put it into the same category as Omega 3 because it already has a layer of uh, concept of layers and so on. So it allows you to do many many things through the user interface, um, which I'm trying to get away from with Omega 4. So uh, with Omega 4, um, we are leaving that category again and coming closer to. Uh, something that is a framework that allows you to utilize the base theme as uh, something that provides sensible defaults and utility functionality for you to use in your sub theme instead of a full stack solution for um, creating your entire site from the user interface. And the adaptive theme is kind of a solution for you to create the entire theme just by clicking on buttons, uh, which is which it serves the use case. So that's the main difference, I would say. Okay. Anything else? Or? Great.